After successfully conquering Acadia, British forces continued with their plans to take over the rest of New France by heading towards France's two centers of power, the fortress at Quebec and Louisburg. Onward ho! So, the first thing on the British capturing New France to-do list was to gain control of Louisburg. But why would they need to first gain control of Louisburg? Well, that is an excellent question. But before I can answer it, I would like to see if you can figure it out. I'll give you a hint. Look at the map and consider the location of the fort. Why would this location be valuable? Think, think, think. Do you think you have it? Well, let's check. The fort guarded the mouth of the St. Lawrence River. And the St. Lawrence River led to the fortress at Quebec. As well, the fort was on the Atlantic coast. And this gave the French access to supplies and troops from France. Gold star for figuring out the answer! Okay, so a fort close to the river and on an ocean. Hmm, how might one take control of such a powerful fortress? Well, the British used quite a strategy here. They sailed a huge number of ships into the harbor in order to block the one side, and soldiers scrambled on shore to block the landward side as well. The siege meant the fort was cut off from the Atlantic Ocean. This stopped France from being able to send supplies and reinforcements that the fort needed. While the French watched from inside the fort, the British sailed their ships in and then began sinking French ships and eventually set their sights on bringing down the fort as well. After seven weeks of bombing the bejeebers out of the fort, the French had had enough. They couldn't take it anymore and surrendered the fort at Louisburg. With Louisburg securely under British control, the second thing on the British capturing New France to-do list was to gain control of Fort Quebec. So let's stop and ponder a moment. If the British control Fort Quebec, what do they also take control of? Think, think, think. Okay, don't hurt yourself, you're still young. If the British control Fort Quebec, they also control all of New France! Holy cow! For British Major General James Wolfe, it was all about the attack. He sailed his fleet of 200 ships with 9,000 soldiers and 1,800 sailors up the St. Lawrence River, bound and determined to conquer this valuable land and claim it for England. Sounds great, right? The British have, of course, just bombed the bejeebers out of Louisburg and successfully cut off supplies and reinforcements from France. They are feeling pretty good about themselves right about now. So why wouldn't they be successful doing the exact same thing in Quebec? Well, Fort Quebec was not going to be as easy to conquer as Louisburg. First of all, the fort sat high on top of a cliff. Why is this helpful, grade sevens? Do, 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 Well, Mrs. Carroll, being up high gives the French, like, an advantage because they can see their enemies coming and then, like, shoot them down. Plus, it would be like super hard uh, for their enemies to climb up the super steep hill. Excellent answer, grade sevens. You are gold star students. Not only that, grade sevens, but Wolf's men could not cut off the fort from the landward side. And to make matters worse, 
winter would be setting in soon. So why is this another problem? Well, winter means snow, and snow means ice. Wolf didn't want his ships frozen in the river. They would lose for sure if that happened. For French commander Marquis de Montcalm, with his stone fortress and 16,000 troops, this was an ideal situation. But, even though he had more soldiers, including many First Nations allies, Montcalm was still worried about the skill of the British forces. His strategy? Stay inside the fort, firing cannons on the British below, while waiting for reinforcements. Eventually, the British would have to retreat, right? A battle raged between the French and the English for nine weeks with cannons fired between the two sides. The fort was in ruins, but had not yet been captured. The British were ready to call it a day, knowing winter was looming around the corner. But Wolfe was determined and refused to accept defeat. So he hatched a plan and made one final attempt at capturing the fort. What could it be? Dun, dun, dun. Wolf knew that behind the fortress was a farmer's field called the Plains of Abraham. But in order for his plan to work, the British forces would have to be sneaky. Very, very, very sneaky. Just before midnight on September 12th, 1759, British boats and soldiers made their way ashore and climbed the super steep path up to the field. When the French awoke, they were shocked. Imagine crawling out of bed, looking out your window, and seeing a thousand of your redcoat enemies in battle position. Talk about waking up on the wrong side of bed. You do have to admire the British perseverance, though. Do you have any idea how heavy a cast iron cannon would have been? At the fort, Montcalm had 6,000 soldiers, including 300 Odawa allies. About 4,400 professional British soldiers awaited Montcalm on the plains. Montcalm's reinforcements had not yet arrived. What was M Montcalm going to do? Should he march out and fight the British head on? Or should he stay safely behind the fortress walls? Oh, what to do? Oh, what to do? In a panic, Montcalm decided he couldn't wait. It was a disastrous decision. The French emerged from the fort to raging musket fire, and after just 15 minutes, the French turned and fled. The British were victorious. It was the bloodiest battle ever fought on Canadian soil, with 1,300 soldiers passing away, including both Wolfe and Montcalm. The British had successfully conquered both French forts and all the defenses in New France. Yay for the British! Now the celebration can begin. Uh, well, uh, not quite. Quebec had been left in ruins, and remaining French inhabitants and British soldiers alike were forced to frantically find food during the winter. In fact, more British soldiers died from disease and starvation after than soldiers who died in the battle itself. Remaining French soldiers fell back to Montreal and continued to resist the British until they were forced to surrender a year later, on September 8, 1760. Finally, the British officially controlled New France. So now the celebration can begin, right? Wrong! British troubles are not over yet. Britain and France were raging war with each other in other parts of the world. You know that whole world domination thing? Yeah, well, the British did finally win three years later, and after seven years of fighting, there is peace between the French and the English. And to make peace official, 
the Treaty of Paris was signed. Under the terms of the treaty, France agreed to give up all claimed land in North America. In return, France received Guadeloupe and two teeny, and I mean teeny, itsy bitsy, microscopic, in comparison to what they had had before, islands of St. Pierre and Miguelon. So now the celebration begins, right? Wrong! Oh my goodness, will this saga never end? Let's not forget about the First Nations. The First Nations were deeply involved in these battles between the French and the English. They primarily supported the French and many died on the battlefield with their allies. However, the First Nations and the British were still in conflict after the French surrendered. The Treaty of Paris gave Britain control of most of North America and this angered the First Nations. Why would this make them mad? Really think hard on this one. Stop! Before you answer, consider the following questions. Where do you think the Treaty of Paris was signed? Who do you think was invited to negotiate the terms of the treaty? How did the British and the First Nations get along? I will now pause for a moment of awkward silence and give you time to reflect. The treaty was signed in Paris, France. The British and the French were at the talks, and the First Nations made a special trip in their canoes across the Atlantic Ocean. <laughs> yeah, right! The First Nations were not invited, nor were they even a fleeting thought. To top it off, the British did not follow the trading practices the First Nations had set up with the French, and the English had began moving into First Nations land. A man named Pontiac was the first to consider war with the English. He convinced several First Nations to lay siege to British forts in Detroit and along Lake Erie. The First Nations knew they couldn't beat the British at their own game, so they took another approach and played a game of their own. In fact, using strategic war tactics, the First Nations were successful at capturing seven of ten British forts. For example, at Fort Michilimackinac, Whew, say that one ten times. The First Nations knew that the British fort was too strong to attack outright. First Nations men and women gathered outside the fort for what looked like a friendly game of lacrosse between the men. The British soldiers were intrigued and watched the game. Then, by accident, one of the First Nations threw the ball through the fort gates. When the men chased the ball into the fort, others were given weapons hidden by the women who were watching. Totally catching the British soldiers off guard, the men captured the fort in just a few minutes. The British were not pleased with Pontiac's success and would not tolerate losing to a bunch of savages and fought back against the resistance. Pontiac knew he now needed help and was waiting for French reinforcements. Makes sense, right? The First Nations had helped the French, so the French should now come and help them. Ah... Alas, Pontiac was out of luck. The French had already surrendered at Montreal and could not help their former allies. The British struck down this resistance in the summer of 1763. Now can the British celebrate their victory? Yes! Yes, they can! Whew, finally! Although the British were successful at taking what the French had and now controlled most of North America, we must remember a few important things about the French. Number one important thing to remember about the French. The French had been in North America for about 150 years and had established a unique identity. Number two important thing to remember about the French. They built farms, wells, and roads. Number three thing to remember about the French. The French had laid the foundations of a successful country by pioneering the fur trade and creating a strong economy. Uh, too bad the British didn't recognize the contributions of the French. More on that in our next video. Dun dun dun!